Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. Marshall. In the years 1906 through 1910, the world in general was at peace. A magic time. China, that sleeping giant, had gone through the Boxer Rebellion and now was temporarily quiescent. And in those halcyon years, the characters of this story lived, breathed, died, and were reborn. You find that statement a little puzzling? I don't blame you. But then, you see, this is a story of reincarnation. Why must you wait so long? Wait? Through 2,000 years, the lotus flower blooms and dies and is born again. But I lie drowning while my ancestors cry in vain for me to join them. I am in my own prison. How can I come to you? Seek me out where I lie. But hurry. We have so little time to become immortal. Find me. Find me. Find me. Our mystery drama... Legend of Phoenix Hill was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Howard Da Silva. It is sponsored in part by X-Lax and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. In the beginning of this century here in America, the world was awakening to a new tempo, a new set of beliefs, horizons that had no limits. We'll forget Mr. Olds, Mr. Ford, the industrialists, and concentrate instead in the fields of academia. In particular, as this story unfolds, on the person of Dr. Samuel Arnold, professor of archaeology, and his adopted son, Lee, now 20 years old, and an honor student in the same subject as his adoptive father. Only somehow, suddenly, the chemistry between them has gone wrong. You're being unreasonable, Lee. Which goes double, Papa. That's my view of you. Oh, don't be a child. This expedition is expensive. It can only afford experts and specialists. They haven't any better credentials than I have. All right, son. If you think you can prove that, give me a for instance. Just give me time, and I'll prove to you how very important it is that I have to be along. My name is Samuel Arnold. I hold the chair of archaeology at Wyndham University. On a most generous grant in this year of 1906, I am organizing a trip to Hunan in China in the belief that in the alluvial deposits there, we may unearth a wealth of artifacts from the great Han Dynasty, which flourished 2,000 years ago. It is an exciting project, and I am bubbling with excitement, an excitement... Not shared, by the way, by my wife, Jessie. Sam, what happened? Oh, Lee and I, we had a slight disagreement. But I've never heard you two talk like that before. No, Jessie, I suppose we haven't, but... Well, the boy is not a boy anymore. That doesn't give him the right to dictate to you. But it does, to his own opinion. <laughs> He's just stretching his wings. Oh, I know. I should be glad you're not taking him. Losing one of my boys is bad enough. Oh, come on now, darling. It's not that bad. Mm. I'll be back inside of six months. Oh, you'd better be. I'm going to miss you. I'll miss you. And Lee. You love him very much, don't you? Like my right arm. He's meant so much to both of us. Sam, I'm sorry I never was able to give you your own child. 
You didn't have to. We've had Lee. And don't forget that in adopting him, we chose him. He's our boy. He's been a good boy. And we've had 20 marvelous years with him. Yes. Would you deny that? Oh, no. No, of course not. He's been a wonderful son in every way. Except... Except what? A little part of him is remote. A place we could never reach. I guess so. Not many people share each other the way you and I do, but <laughs> there's no one of us who's somewhere within himself, doesn't walk a secret strand, listen to the music of alien seas. Is that a quote? Huh? No. No, I guess it isn't. Sam, I don't know, but I think somehow you should take Lee along. Darling... How can I justify a student on an expedition for which every first-ranked person in this field has offered himself? I have to judge each member of the team on what he can offer the whole. I know, Sam. I understand. But somehow I... I don't know why. Something inside me tells me you've got to take Lee with you. It was nonsense, of course. Or was it? So many times during all the years I've watched and been surprised by this incredible son of mine. His parents, as well as I could judge from the Adoption Bureau, were American citizens. But I've always sensed that one of them must have had an Oriental background. Two sources for my hunch. One, a sheerly ethnological suggestion, a certain fold in the skin above the eyes, which gave them an Oriental cast. The other... I don't know how to explain that except to tell you that, well, to tell you the facts in this curious case as it developed. Lee, where have you been the last few days? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I'm not going to lie to you. I, I went to New York and I had a lot of drinks and somehow I found myself in Chinatown. Where in Chinatown? I, I don't know the address. I... I was just stumbling along, and suddenly there was this Chinese beside me, and he said, You want to be happy. You come have pipe dream. A and he took me inside. To an opium den? I, I guess so. I it was all mixed up. I, I remember I was lying on a pad, and the whole world was swimming around me like I was in a fishbowl tank. And then... All of a sudden, there was this sound, and she was there. Why must you wait so long? Wait? Through 2,000 years, the lotus flower blooms and dies, and is born again. But I lie drowned while my ancestors cry in vain for me to join them. I am in my own prison. How can I come to you? Seek me out where I lie. How, how can I find you? Follow in your father's footsteps, and it will be made known. But how? Seek the magic mirror. It will tell you all. But come fast. Fast, my lover. The body may last. But in this prison, my soul is a fading butterfly. Where have they blown us with the wind? To the edges of darkness and the empty void? We have so little time to remain immortal. Find me. Find me. Find me. Papa, I tell you, it was... It was weird. I, I woke right up in this little place, and, and they were having a fair. Y you know, stalls and games and balloons and all. And, and I wandered around a while, and, and then there was this one place, and it... It had, you know, uh, old metal and brass and lamps and things like that. And there was another Chinese behind the counter, and, and this was 
what I bought. Let me see it. Here. Where did you get this? I'm telling you, I don't know. I, I, I just have it. And it's really important. I wouldn't dispute you for the moment. You realize how ancient this must be? I got a feeling. And what it is? Why do you think I shined it up? It's a mirror. A metal one. Heaven knows how ancient. Convex face. Probably bronze. And it's a little more than just a mirror, Papa. What do you mean? Before I show you, let me ask you again to take me with you to China. Why? Maybe I can show you why. Look in the mirror. What do you see? What else? A dim, distorted vision of myself. Okay. Then come with me. <laughs> Lee, you lugged me here to the old dry well. Now what? I don't honestly know, Papa. I'm only traveling on hunches and things I don't understand. Just let me follow this old superstition. Mm, drop a mirror into the well and pull it out. Yeah. You'll find the girl you can't live without. Uh, yeah. Mom used to quote that old saw. I'm going to try it. Watch. Okay. Here's the mirror. <gasps> What is it? You look, Papa. I can't see anything. You can't see that girl? In the mirror? Save me. I wait. Save me. I wait. Save me. Papa. Save did you see the... me. I don't have my glasses. It's a poor image. Shadowed and shaky. I'm sorry, son. Uh, what did you want me to see? What has to be seen? Didn't you even hear her? Hear her? Oh, what's the use? You can't understand why I must be with you when you go to China. Just convince me you would be of use, and I will take you. Where will you know to go for the dig? That's all mapped out. What do you expect to find there? Artifacts, utensils, evidence of a culture that goes back over... Two millennia. You hope to find more than that. Yes, son, I do. I've done some private research that suggests we might even find, preserved, some remains of actual people who lived B.C. in the Han Dynasty. And I can tell you that you will. Not partially preserved, but wholly so. After 2,000 years? After 2,000 years. How do you know? The voices which have been with me all my life. What happened to me a few minutes ago is not surprising to me. Papa, level with me? I've always tried to, Lee. You and Mom adopted me nearly 20 years ago. That's no secret. But you still insist you know nothing of my background, who I am, where I came from. That isn't exactly true. We had a general profile of your mother and very little of your father... The orphanage, as you know, tries to match parents and children on many levels. We felt, your mother and I, that we both had something to offer each other, you and us. Have you ever been sorry? I can speak for your mother as well as myself. Not for one single moment. Not even now? Now? Now that I'm on your back to include me in the expedition. I thought you understood and that was settled. I thought maybe you understood that I didn't agree. I thought perhaps you were beginning to realize what I've grown into. What's that? Your contact with the past. Just, just let me try once more to let you understand I must be with you. For your sake as well as mine. Son, please. Just, just, just give me this one last chance. Now look, now, before the water is dry... Can you see? Come to me. Save me. Come to me. Save me. I don't... I don't... It, it's not possible, but... There is a face. And such a face. You saw? I saw. Then may I go with you? Yes, son. You may go. 
thanks, Papa. The question that haunts me is, will you come back? A strange beginning to a very simple story. But it will not remain simple long. Let's spend a minute on adoption, which today is such a common and marvelous practice. Could Dr. and Mrs. Arnold have adopted today as strange a child as Lee has proven to be? No chance. But let us remember, this is 70 years ago, and many things were possible then. I shall return shortly with Act Two. In 1906, the two great methods of commercial travel were the railroad and the steamships. It was by railroad that Professor Samuel Arnold's expedition to China set out, crossing the American continent in May of that year with two full cars of equipment to be transferred on the West Coast to a steamer. And on that railroad trip... Oh, no, it's uh, Professor Arnold's story. Let him tell it himself. May 9, 1906. We are finally off on a great adventure. The train is moving. We are on our way to China, and what? What marvels we may reveal, what miracles may happen are beyond comprehension. I'm as excited as a child, pleased about all the members of our adventure, save perhaps only one, the one iconoclast amongst us, that brilliant misanthrope by election and pathologist by profession, Dr. Hubert Stern. By heaven, I never thought we'd do it, but we're on our way. And I should have my head examined. Why, Hubert? I'm getting involved in this, this Chinese pipe dream. It's really ludicrous. I repeat it. Why? Oh, I've no doubt you'll dig up your odds and ends, your shards, pottery and the like, but any record or, or any evidence of human remains, that's impossible. Sam, the Chinese are not Egyptians or Mayans. They have absolutely no history of embalming or the preservation of bodies. You will reincarnate a great deal more than that, Dr. Stern. I beg your pardon. Who, who are you, young man? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't believe you met my son, Dr. Stern. This is Lee. Your son? My adopted son. How do you do, Doctor? Oh, I do very well. But, uh... May I ask what was the meaning of that strange remark you just made? Just what I said, Doctor. I think we are going to find people who once lived during the Han Dynasty. Oh, really? And I trust you're not prophesying alive. <laughs> no, sir. That is, not in the sense you mean. They will have been held in what you might call suspended animation. Ah, oh, remarkable. And how do you perceive all this? I can't explain. <laughs> I should think not. How old are you? Not quite 21, sir. Well, that's even more remarkable. So young and so, now what would be the word of choice, eh? Uh -huh. Percipient or perhaps just fanciful? Tell me, Sam, is your son accompanying us on, on this expedition? He is. Really? As a member? Yes. Not quite 21? Well, in what field is he accredited? Lee is studying archaeology, but he is with me as my secretary. I am defraying whatever expenses he may incur. Well, it's not a question of money, Professor Arnold. It's of opportunity and the honor to be part of this expedition. Hubert, disregarding your naturally bileful nature for the moment, let me say that because of your eminence as a pathologist, I felt you must be along. For no other reason would I have wanted you. Now you imply there is no reason for your being here at all, that we will find nothing to interest you on this dig. So let me ask you a question. What the devil do you want to be along for? I want to be along because it's my right. No matter what we find or don't. And I certainly have infinitely more reason to be here than this young man who is still too wet behind the ears to know what he's talking about. Even if he is your, uh, your uh, well, adopted son. I may be young by your measurements, Dr. Stern. But in China, you may discover that you are the amateur. Lee. No matter what the provocation, you will not be rude to a man of Dr. Stern's eminence. I'm sorry, Father. The best thing for me to do is leave. This is an unfortunate note on which to start out a great adventure. It's hardly an adventure. It's a scientific expedition. But I have a strange feeling quite unscientific, I assure you. 
that bringing that young man along is a mistake. I don't think that's for you to decide. Well, it may be, since my hunch is that he's destined to bring us bad luck. <laughs> April 19, 1906. We are at last in San Francisco, and the refurbished supplies and equipment lost in the train wreck on March 9th, scarcely after we had begun, are now on the dock waiting to be loaded on the ship. Everyone has taken the unfortunate delay very well. The loss of a month on our special calendar, with the exception of Dr. Stern, he unreasonably has marked Lee as a sort of Jonah, as though he was some threat to our plans. Good morning, Sam. Morning, Hubert. Are you joining me? Yes, if I may. You look a little tired. Not tired. Concerned. About what? Well, I, uh... Uh, if you must know about the, uh... About the expedition. Sam, I, I, I can't explain this, but I'm asking you to send the boy home. What for? Well, I know he's your adopted son, but he shouldn't be on this trip. He he carries disaster with him. What are you talking about? If I explained, I don't suppose you'd believe me. But if you persist, I warn you, we are headed for disastrous failure. April 20, 1906, San Francisco. I've been unable to keep up my log for a couple of days. I am heartily ashamed now that I laughed at that ridiculous little man, Dr. Hubert Stern. His prophecy has turned out to be true. This vital, throbbing port now lies in agonized ruins after the terrible earthquake that struck it the day before yesterday. Not that I think my son had anything to do with such an elemental force of nature. It is only that my conscience gnaws at me. What strange, mystical voice cried out a warning to Dr. Stern? And why was he so certain our mission was doomed? Dr. Stern is gone, crushed in the first tremor. And when the port will return to normal is anyone's guess. We are facing, at the very least, another long delay. I'm determined that's all it will be. Captain says we should be making land soon, Papa. Thank heaven. I don't like this weather. Neither does the captain. The barometer's dropped out of sight. Looks like there's a typhoon on the way. Granddaddy of them all. Oh, but look! I can see. That must be Hong Kong. I only hope we can make it before the storm hits. But we didn't. For that was September 19, 1906. And we were in the path of the biggest typhoon in recorded history. The wind slammed into us like a giant hand, sweeping up the ship like a cork and whirling it away clockwise from the coast and out into the China Sea. September 28, 1906. For the first time almost since we began this journey, my heart is beginning to lift. Today, we watched the ship from which we were all rescued when the storm had blown itself out, towed into port, and made fast to the dock. By some miracle, waterlogged though she may be, she did not go down. And I am awaiting now a report from our British contact here in Hong Kong as to how badly damaged our cargo is. Come in. Ah, uh, hello, Sir Reginald. What news? Rather good, Sam, actually. Take a little time, it's drying out, one thing and another, but uh, I don't think we have to be too down in the mouth. Oh, by the way, Professor Arnold, allow me to introduce His Honor, Huang Du Cheng. I am most honored, most estimable, Professor. Thank you. How do you do? Uh, Mr. Cheng is, uh, shall I say, Mandarin or governor of the area where we all hope eventually to dig in Hunan. Well, this is a pleasure. But I'd expected to meet you on your own home ground. Surely it's a long trip here to Hong Kong from Sarah Asa Gol. A long trip, yes. But I felt an imperative one. I wish you to call off your expedition, Professor Arnold. Call it off? Certainly not. Sir Reginald, I thought I had the assurances of the British government that... Oh, no one's going back on his word or anything like that. The uh, point is the matter is more or less academic for the moment, don't you know? No, I don't know. Why? 
Well, with the delays, we've rather come a cropper. I mean, we've lost the good summer weather, and winter is hardly the time for a dig. We still have a couple of reasonable months. Certainly enough time to make a start. The delays have been unfortunate, of course, but accidents of Excuse nature... Excuse me, are... Professor, but we Chinese do not consider them accidents, and certainly not wholly of nature. A train crash because of a river flooded and swept away the roadbed, the San Francisco earthquake, a monstrous typhoon. Surely you can't believe our expedition had anything to do with them. I'm afraid we do, Professor. What? Our ancestors, we think, have spoken. They do not wish to be disturbed. But good Lord, this is ancient superstition. We are scientists. You can't seriously believe, Mr. Chang, that there's any logical connection between the accidents we've weathered and our expedition. At least one member of your expedition did, Dr. Stern. He felt there was a bad influence traveling with you. How could you know about Hubert? Oh, you may remember Dr. Stern visited China several years ago and made our acquaintance at that time. Before he died, he wrote to both of us about... Damn it, I'm sorry to bring this up, but about your son... You can't think that the presence of a boy, not yet 21, is any way injurious to the success of our mission? Let me please explain. First, I must recall to you a legend of our people. In the year of the peacock, or as reckoned in the Western world, the year 23 BC, exactly two millennia ago, the Sun Emperor in the Han Dynasty was Han Chu Chang, and the Emperor had a daughter of Sop passing beauty who was called Mylum. According to custom, this princess was promised in marriage to the highest of the mandarins in the province of Hunan. But Mylum thirsted after a young warrior in the imperial guard as he did for her. There was no hope for their love, so the night before the imperial wedding, hand in hand, the lovers climbed the 77 steps of the Ta'a, the sacred temple, and hand in hand flung themselves to their death on the rocks below. The emperor, prostrated by sorrow, had the broken body of his daughter reclaimed and restored and buried in a tomb so that her beauty would remain undimmed for twice a thousand years. I am aware of the legend, in part that is why we are here, with the hope that by some miracle of the embalming art, we may find this ancient princess who lived 2,000 years ago. And my answer to that is over my dead body. Not at least if your so-called son is part of that discovery. So-called? Just because he is adopted? And why? What do you have against him? The young warrior with whom Princess Mairung met her death was called... Litzeang, when he lay broken on the rocks, he was not yet dead. It is said he screamed aloud that in another world, another time, he would come back to reclaim his love. We believe, my countrymen and I, that your son Li is the reincarnation of that man. And we will not let him take our princess from us. How many times has the questing desire of man to dig into the past run up against the equally strong desire for the superstitious to resist, deeming the past inviolable, not to be interfered with? And although the human urge is to add to knowledge, is it always in the human interest to explore things long buried? Or is it better to say with Longfellow, let the dead past bury its dead? I shall return shortly with Act Three. Whatever Henry was with Longfellow's feeling about leaving the dead undisturbed was, it is not shared by Professor Samuel Arnold. He has come to China to dig. And to paraphrase a utility company slogan, dig he must. So, unwillingly, he has forced himself to a disagreeable task. So what you're trying to tell me, Papa, is I'm out? It's so ludicrous, I know, but we are on an alien shore when in Rome. I know this is important to you, an adventure, a, a call, a dream. 
Even something more than that. But... A lot more than that. Remember the mirror in the well? Remember the face? Yes. And remember you agreed that I was your contact with the past? Oh, that was a thousand lifetimes ago after what we've been through in the last few months. Son, if I try to take you with us, they will not grant permission for the expedition to leave. Answer me something, Lee. Why? You mean, why me? Yes. Who are you? You know that better than I do. Except... Except what? Go on. Please don't misunderstand this, but I feel it was fated for me to come here at this time and at this place. And more than that, that somehow I am coming home. The girl in the mirror? Yes. That and a thousand sense memories. Hard to explain. Don't try. You are going to take me after all? No. I am more than ever determined to send you home. I am assailed by feelings I neither understand nor can cope with. I have to save you somehow from fate. And for your mother, who might never forgive me if I didn't. I'm arranging for your departure on the first boat I can book you on. Five October, 1906. At last, we are on the site. A whole lifetime of anticipation, dreaming, speculating. I feel guilty about Lee, but I mustn't. I can't think of that for the moment. With Sir Reginald today, I scrambled all over Feng Huan Shang, which means Phoenix Hill. It's really quite incredible when you face it. What? That you are so convinced we will uncover human remains. Why? Because there's nothing in the Chinese culture as we know it to suggest that they knew anything about or care enough to preserve the human body. Yes, I know. Artifacts, yes. I hope and am convinced we will uncover those. But what makes you so sure we will uncover human remains? I don't know. Write it off in American terms to what we call a hunch. A little more than that, I should think. <laughs> I should hope. Yes, a good deal more than that. I can't explain, or, or rather I won't, except to say that the vision was my son's. I say, that's too bad. What a pity you had to send him home. I wonder. I wonder if perhaps in human terms it wasn't a blessing. 7 November, 1906. We have been digging now for a month. And it is only in the last few days that we have probed deep enough to expect results. But there are none to report. I find that I do not trust Chang. For some reason, I feel that he has deliberately misled us. You have found nothing yet, Professor. No. Hard to understand. The terrain is perfect. Soil, location, history. I say, Professor, we seem to have made a strike... Have a look at these. Yes, clay figures. Yes, these could be. What else have you got? One or two seals cut from jade or some other hard stone. Hmm. Yes, yeah, yes. Yes, possibly. And yes, here, possibly. we've just uncovered a mortuary vessel, embellished with bronze forms and encircled by bands of hunting scenes in relief. By heaven, we may have struck pay dirt at last. Come on, let's go have a look. 8 November 1906. It has just turned midnight, and I am almost too exhausted to enter this in the log, but I must. Because now I am convinced that this expedition is doomed, was doomed before we even started out. Oh, I'm not talking about any supernatural agency. The enemy is flesh and blood, and his name is Mandarin Chang. We dig furiously all day without turning up any artifacts, and by now, I know why. The artifacts were buried recently for us to discover. The dig, in other words, has been salted in an attempt to mislead us into thinking that we are digging at the right place. Why? And why is Chang attempting to delude us? Yes, yes, who is it? All right, I'm coming. Lee, son, what are you doing here? Wait till I close the door. Are we alone? Yes. But now, where... I didn't go home. It's as simple as that. 
I cashed in my ticket and used the money to come up here to Fen Huang Shang. You disobeyed me? Yes. Because I knew what Chang would do to you. How could you know? My mirror told me. Told you what? In three more days, it will be my birthday. I have only till then to find Mei Long. So that we can be united again at last. So that at last we can go together before the Son of Heaven and live forever in peace. Help me, Dad. Help you? Do what? She lies across the valley. But I ran out of money, and my coolies deserted me. The ground is freezing. I can't do it alone. So we have been digging in the wrong place. Made fools of by Chang. Why? Because he's afraid of the truth. What truth? Two thousand years ago, the princess Mai Lung and I gave ourselves to each other in marriage in the sacred temple of the 77 steps. But before we could run away together... Seize him! You are too late, Mandarin Chan. We are married. Seize the priest, too. Take him outside, kill him, and burn the body. No! No! Do not hurt him. He knows too much. He has to die. And Lee, not Lee, too. That depends on you. If you will marry me, I will let him go. Oh, but I cannot. I am already married. Only the boy, you, and myself know that. And my soldiers, they can be trusted to keep the secret. If you wish to save Li Tung, you must marry me. I will not lose this. You cannot force me. Take him. One of you, help me with the girl. Let me go. <laughs> Let me go. <laughs> when my father hears Your of father this, father promised you, you to me, and I intend to oh, have you. My Lord, oh, don't think of me. Oh, think of yourself. Oh, to die. Oh, is not so much. And you will join me one day. Don't no. sell yourself to him. Back him to the edge of the cliff. So, now, my lord, make up your mind. You have no choice. Yes. Yes, I do. I choose death rather than dishonor. Seek me out in heaven. My husband, Lee. I love you. Melung! Send him after her. Throw him off. Melung, I come! The Mandarin was Chang's ancestor. He was able to cover up the murder. And all these years, the secret has been kept. It has lain buried in the coffin with Mei Lung. How do you know all this? The same way as I know where she lies. She told me through the mirror. This is how I found the right place. Holding the mirror by this cord around it and using it like a dowser uses a wand or a stick to find water. Watch and listen. We all of us watched and listened in awe, heard the faraway voice, watched the burnished metal glow and shimmer in the dancing light of the flare, and swore that just for a moment we could see in it a face, young and of unsurpassed beauty, the face that eight hours later stared up at us from where the Princess Meilong lay in what had been an airtight coffin, immersed in a bath of red liquid, 2,000 years old and as perfectly preserved as if she had gone to sleep only the night before. I must say, I'm absolutely dumbfounded. I might say I'm terrified. I have a terrible feeling that somehow we are not at the end of this. If you mean Chang, I don't think he dares make a move against us, no matter how much he values his precious face. Surely a 2,000-year-old legend can't matter all that much to him. Well, I don't know. That's why I gave young Lee a revolver. If he's going to insist on standing watch over the little princess all night, I thought it better your son should be armed. My son? I wonder... Is that really who he is? Meet the end? Yes, my lord. You know what still has to be done? Yes. But then I will lose you again. So long as my body still lives, I cannot join my ancestor. If I cannot... Then you can never join me. 
Lift me from where I lie. I want to go home. If it must be. <laughs> Goodbye, my heart. Oh, put me down. <laughs> My soul can escape the prison of my body. We will soon be together again. So, here you are. But it will do you no good. Die, you fool. No. Uh, you kill. What happened, son? Watch out. Chang has a gun. He's... He's dead. And you, son, are you... As good as dead. Good Lord. He's taken the princess out of the coffin. Help me get her back, Professor, before... Too late. She's gone home. And I... I'm going to... to join her. Lee. Good Lord. What is it? The princess. Look at her. She's literally dissolving. And my son, he's turning to ashes. They're both going back where they belong. A curious tale, and one I'm sure many of you may scoff at and call hard to believe. Perhaps, yet only the other day, in northern Hupei province, the cradle of Chinese civilization, Chinese archaeologists discovered the body of a man buried and embalmed at least 2,000 years ago with a complete set of teeth, elastic skin, movable joints, and intact internal organs even to the thyroid, the organ which decomposes most easily. So, which is stranger, truth or fiction? I shall be back shortly. Death is nearly always tragic, particularly when it overtakes the young. But for those who believe in life after death, sometimes it is a welcome visitor. As George Santayana said, happiness is the only sanction of life. Where happiness fails, existence remains a mad and lamentable experience. Our cast included Howard Da Silva, Bob Caliban, E.V. Juster, and Ian Martin. The entire production is under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Enjoy this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoy